Let me take a brief moment uh, to remind you to uh, actually pull your cell phones out, look at them, and then turn them off. Uh, we have a device in the back that when the cell phone goes off, a lever is released and it takes out over whoever's head uh, the cell phone is attached to. I'm kidding about the lever, but please turn your cell phones off. Good evening and welcome to Practical Wisdom, the Character of the Professions, the third annual symposium on vocation and professionalism across the professions. My name is Douglas Thompson, and I am serving this term as the interim director of Mercer Commons. I'd like to say a little bit about the Commons, um, because in part it's why we are here tonight, although not uh, a direct outgrowth of a Commons project uh, for this particular lecture. The Commons is set up as a way for the various, well, campuses, uh, as well as divisions across the university that are very different. Uh, professional schools, graduate programs, undergraduate programs, and diversity within the undergraduate programs. The Commons provides a space for conversation, dialogue, around issues related to faith and learning. The Commons was structured to talk about vocation, and it is in that context uh, and as a project for uh, Mark Jones as a Commons Fellow uh, that this program has evolved and developed. Uh, and it is on the Commons behalf that I welcome you here tonight uh, and we'll turn it over to Jack Sammons. Thanks, Doug, and thank all of you for coming tonight. You're in for a treat. Um, I wish I could tell you that I uh, have known uh, Ken and Barry for a very long time, that I followed their work closely, um, and that when uh, Peter Brown and Mark Jones uh, were looking for ideas about how to understand professional education, its relationship, the profession's relationship to each other and to undergraduate education and the like, that uh, their names immediately came to mind, and I offered them, but none of that would be true. The truth of the matter is I found them on a Google search. Um, it, it, it was a Google Scholar search. So <laughs> um, well, I typed in practical wisdom. It may have been practical wisdom in the professions. And it's sort of like the old joke about pictures and dictionary. Uh, both of them popped up. And I thought, oh, my, these are either two very wise men. <laughs> or uh, they are teaching and writing on the subject of practical wisdom in the professions, and fortunately for us, it turned out to be both. Um, I'll have to, I, I made a decision to uh, send an email to Barry to start a conversation, and I'll have to tell you that, and he probably remembers this, that uh, my roof was up a bit, uh, and the reason for that was that my experience with Undergraduate courses about the profession in the past had been very disappointing. Uh, those courses typically encourage undergraduate students to take a critical stance outside of the profession uh, to avoid uh, the corruption of their humanity that uh, uh, the professions, uh, uh, the, the effect that the being in the profession and the role of the professional might have upon them. And that always seemed to me to be a strategy that produced the opposite of its intended results. Rather than humanizing the professions, it made it impossible. It took all the humanity out of it. Um, so I, I was worried that their course was going to be like that. But in the initial exchange of emails with uh, Barry, uh, I discovered that we had a mutual admiration for Alison McIntyre. And, his approach to uh, practices, and so the rough went down immediately. And uh, that Barry uh, was uh, teaching from a perspective that a practice can provide a teleology in which the virtues, and including the moral virtues, make sense. That works as well, and this was the hard part, uh, for a virtue like the virtue of practical wisdom that has got to be connected in some fashion to a life well lived. And uh, that's what they were doing. I found their syllabus. It's about 41, 42 pages, something like that. And I read through this syllabus, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Um, there was more insight into practical wisdom in that syllabus than in any article I had read in a very long time. And 
I, I, I knew we had found our, our right people. The syllabus starts with friendship, and I thought that was exactly right. I didn't find out until tonight that Ken is an Aristotle scholar, so it made sense to do it uh, um, that way. But I knew I, we had found the people that we needed. Now, um, Peter and Mark got into this thinking more about education and, and professional education specifically than about practical wisdom. Um, practical wisdom becomes sort of the tool for understanding higher education. In, in a world like ours, and I believe this relates to the subject uh, for uh, tonight, it's increasingly dominated by technique. Practical wisdom offers a way of making sense of education. It can be a, a common ground among the professions. It can be a way of understanding uh, the, uh, what liberal arts education can offer to the professions, a way of seeing that is in a continuum. Uh, and uh, this is the part that Peter was most interested in, a way of distinguishing a university, a way of a university thinking about an overarching role for itself in which it can draw the liberal arts and all of the uh, professions in together. Um, and in the process of doing all of that, um, actually accomplish what my liberal arts uh, colleagues from the past wanted to do, and that is to value our humanity. Well, uh, we contacted, or Peter and Mark contacted Ken and Barry, and they graciously agreed to, to join us in this. I want to tell you a little bit um, about them from the bio, and uh, you will see that they come to the subject of practical wisdom uh, oddly, I guess you might say. They both have uh, established reputations in uh, academic reputations in um, well, uh, for Barry in other topics and for Ken in completely other fields. But I think that's exactly what you would hope for when the subject is practical wisdom. Uh, people who bring from their own fields and uh, what they have learned uh, um, into the subject of uh, practical wisdom. Barry is the Dorwin Cartwright Professor of Social Theory and Social Action at Swarthmore. That's in the psychology department at Swarthmore. And he's probably best known, and you probably have heard of him, through the book uh, called The uh, Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less. That got an enormous amount of play, both uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, articles in the New York Times, the New York Times Magazine, the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, he appeared on Lair uh, News Hour, uh, Anderson Cooper, and so forth and so on. People uh, discovered that the choice problem that uh, Barry had identified was relevant to uh, every corner of modern society. Uh, he and Ken are working on a book on practical wisdom, and I certainly hope it gets that kind of play. Uh, that, would be, uh, that would be lovely. And then uh, Ken uh, is the William R. Keenan uh, Professor of uh, Political Science at Swarthmore. And in um, 2002, actually, is that when the course started in 2002 as well? Because in 2002 and uh, to three, he spent an entire year with a, a Mellon Foundation grant doing research on practical wisdom in contemporary life, and it was research and preparation for this particular course. He, however, is best known for his uh, uh, work on the drug wars in Latin America, and especially for the book, The Drug War Politics, the, the uh, Price of uh, Denial, um, which was, uh, we were chatting earlier, which is also the politics of denial, um, the denial that the approach that we were taking to the drug war uh, had any chance of success, and yet we continued to pursue it, and that's the problem that interested him as to why we uh, continue to pursue a, a, a hopeless approach. He's written widely on U.S. Foreign, uh, foreign policy in Central uh, America and has had the, I don't know whether it was pleasant or not, uh, experience of testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, and uh, his work has uh, appeared in uh, national journals as well, the Washington Post, New York Times, and Christian Science Monitor and so forth. I want to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming these two distinguished and wise uh, men uh, for uh, uh, joining us tonight. Thank you. It was a very, very kind and gracious introduction, and we're very, very excited to be here. 
we thought that we were working in a vacuum and it is incredibly gratifying to know whatever the comes of your project that there's a bunch of people who take these issues very seriously and if all if everything breaks right we may transform professional education and which god knows it needs so here's what we're going to do ken tends to fall asleep at his own talks so so we're going to we're going to do this like a tag team match i'm going to talk for a little while then he's going to talk for a little while then i'll talk for a little while and so on it'll stop you from falling asleep it'll stop us from falling asleep it'll make both of us feel a little bit important so that's the plan uh and the structure of what we're going to do is as follows i'm i'm going to start out by talking about why we need practical wisdom in professional life without defining it Ken's then going to talk about what it is again without defining it. Then we're going to talk about why and how it is being threatened. What the threat why there is a war on wisdom currently being waged unintentionally in every corner of uh, modern society. And then we'll talk finally about how we might respond to this threat, to this stealth war. So that's the plan. So first, why do we need wisdom? uh and i the way i will uh talk to you about this is by giving you four illustrations of wisdom in action uh in different domains of life <clears throat> the first one comes from a an article that Jerome Groupman wrote in the new yorker several years ago he's a distinguished oncologist at uh, massachusetts general hospital um and he i'm largely going to be quoting him or and at least paraphrasing him Um so this is Jerome Groupman. You're Jerome Groupman an oncologist and you've just started treating Maxine, a 30-year-old woman who discovered a pea-sized lump in her breast. Tests have revealed that the lump is malignant and that the cancer has already spread to her spine and liver. Now as she sits across the desk from you, accompanied by her parents and her fiance, you have to tell her that in all likelihood she'll be dead in 2 years. how should this conversation go on the one hand the canons of medical ethics not to mention more general moral principles that demand that we treat human beings with respect tell you that you have to tell maxine the truth but on the other hand there are lots of different ways to tell the truth there are lots of different truths and your approach may determine whether this woman's last months of life are full of hopelessness and misery or whether she'll have the strength to go through the rigorous treatment that awaits her with some measure of optimism so you begin groupman began by reviewing the facts the size and location of the original tumor and the evidence of spread but before complete hopelessness sets in you quickly say that the cancer should be treated aggressively you stand a strong chance of remission you say Now your patient's mother responds with, quote, "So that means she'll be okay." And you realize that now you have to backtrack a little. You have to make clear that remission isn't cure. Treatment may make the current metastatic deposits go away, but they will almost certainly come back in other places. Treatment is palliative. But what does palliative mean? You go on. We can knock out the cancer with drugs. Your bones and liver can heal. You can go back to living a normal life. And when do you say when or if the cancer returns? We'll work to knock it down. Do you say down or out? Again. Meanwhile, new treatments may emerge from research that are far more effective than our current ones. So at the very least we're buying time. Now what? You've presented a best case and their eyes are welling with tears. but you have to present a worst case also you have to let your patient know that a point may or perhaps you should say will be reached at which treatments are no longer effective you have to say this both because you owe your patient an honest assessment and because you will likely face decisions about when to stop therapy that she should be thinking about while she is still well enough to do so coherently so you present the worst case also Your patient seems satisfied. She doesn't seem to want to know any more. 
But her fiancé chimes in. What are the odds of a remission? He wants to know. You look at him, no doubt sneer at him, after stealing a quick glance at your patient. Does she want to know? Does she want this question answered? She doesn't seem to want to know. The doctor says that there's every reason to think I'll go into remission. Does this comment let you off the hook? Or should you present the bold statistics that more than 50% of patients with this presentation die within two years? Should you find a gentler way of saying this that focuses on the positives, how young the patient is, how good her health is in general? How much will your patient benefit, both medically and psychologically, from a little encouragement? And can you find a way to be encouraging without creating false hope? How well do the people sitting across from you understand statistics? How well do they know that probable does not mean certain? And that there is a distribution of courses to this illness, and at the tails of the distribution are a small number of people who die very quickly and a small number who live decent lives for many years. So you choose not to answer the question directly and instead deceive just a little by telling them how little statistics can tell us about any particular individual. You conclude by saying, we need to plan for the best while acknowledging the worst. All the while that you are having this painful conversation, you realize that it isn't just what you say that matters, but how you say it. If you hesitate too long before answering a bleak question, no matter how encouraging you are, they will think you're holding something back. If you're too upbeat in describing the most positive scenario, they'll leave the office with unrealistic hopes. For you to pull this off, both the form and the content have to be just right. So this is one example, and I suspect that people get very little training in medical school about how to do this, that uh, demands in our view, wise doctors. Here's a second, the case of Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones was a homeowner, a churchgoer, and at 65, a well-respected member of a lower middle class black community. After a minor traffic accident, she stopped to identify herself, but the other driver, a white woman, fled. And then this other driver called the police and reported Mrs. Jones as the one who fled. The police, without investigating, took the other woman's word for it. Even after the woman dropped the charges, the police insisted on prosecuting Mrs. Jones for leaving the scene of an accident. A very young William Simon, now a very famous uh, lawyer and professor, was asked by his law firm to defend Mrs. Jones. He knew she was innocent. She'd been made to suffer both indignity and injustice. Simon planned to expose the racism of the police through devastating cross-examination. He asked a friend with a lot of experience in traffic cases for help. Dismissal on racism charges, he wondered. His friend rolled his eyes. Not with this judge and these police. And if Mrs. Jones lost, unlikely but possible, said his friend, she'd lose her license, she'd be fined, and perhaps even face a jail term of up to six months. The friend worked out a plea bar bargain with the prosecutor. Plea nolo contendra. Uh, neither admitting dispute, nor disputing the charges, accept six months probation, apply to have the case sealed after a year, and Mrs. Jones' criminal record would disappear. No trial, no loss of license, no anxiety. Simon didn't like it. He felt Mrs. Jones deeply resented her recent abuse, and a plea bargain would deprive her of any sense of vindication. But he presented it to her because he knew, after all, that it was her decision to make. In court, before the trial, he laid out the plea to Mrs. Jones and her minister. Then, uh, they then asked his advice. You're the expert, they say. That they said, that's what we come to lawyers for. And this is Simon speaking. I insisted that because the decision was hers, I couldn't tell her what to do. I then spelled out the pros and cons. However, I mentioned the cons last. And the final thing I said was, if you took their offer, there probably wouldn't be any bad practical consequences, but it wouldn't be justice. Up to that point, Mrs. Jones and her minister seemed ambivalent, but that last phrase seemed to have a dramatic effect on them. In unison, they said, we want justice. So Simon went back to his friend. No deal. She wants justice. 
My friend stared for a moment in disbelief and then said, let me talk to her. He laid out the same considerations. He didn't tell her what to do. But in making his presentation, he discussed the disadvantages of trial last, while Simon had gone over them first. He described the remote possibility of jail at slightly greater length than Simon had. And he didn't conclude by saying it wouldn't be total justice. At the end of his presentation, Mrs. Jones and her minister decided to accept the plea bargain. As I said nothing further, that's what they did. The principles of legal ethics told Simon that the client should have the autonomy to decide. And decide Mrs. Jones did. Twice. Differently. With a subtle shift of frame. First a justice frame, then a criminal record frame. No attempt was made to understand Mrs. Jones' perspective. No effort was made to encourage reflection. Legal counsel were given 10 minutes just prior to walking into court. Third example, grading papers. This is something that Ken and I encounter all the time. I suspect many of you do too. So you're grading papers. You read one written by a student who's struggling to get a C. It's a B minus C plus paper. Coherently organized, decently written, no major misunderstandings, but it is by far the best thing this student has done in your course. Then there's the paper by the smartest kid in the class. She's effortlessly acing everything you throw her way. It's well written, clearly organized, and it demonstrates fine comprehension. Solid B plus, perhaps an A minus, but it lacks spark. It isn't very original. It doesn't go very far beyond what's been said in class. The student could definitely have done a much better piece of work. So what grades do you give? Do you give the grades that they deserve? Well, yes, but what grades do they deserve? According to some absolute standard, according to a relative scale, according to effort, according to improvement, according to fidelity to the test, texts, according to creative spark, what grade is the fair grade to give? One last example much more prosaic, is uh, some vignettes from the lives of high, uh, hospital janitors. So in hospital settings, which tend to be quite hierarchical, at the very bottom of the hierarchy are the custodial staff, the people who clean up. And a colleague of mine studied them uh, and wrote some wonderfully detailed case histories. And here are a few quotes from various uh, hospital janitors. Sometimes I might start waxing and a patient comes out and he wants to walk up and down the hall. He wants to get exercise. As soon as I get ready to, wa to wash up, to wa wax the floor, he'll start walking. So I don't bother him. I just wait because I know I can't tell them to go sit down. They need to build themselves up and that's what I have to tell my supervisor. Couldn't do it because of the patients. Another one. I treat them with respect. I know that, you know, why they're here. And, you know, like a lot of times when I go into the visitor's lounge, you know, to clean, I have to ask them too. Sometimes I don't bother because a lot of times when I go in to clean, they'll be asleep. So, uh, but, you know, supervisors, my supervisor has told me that I'm supposed to do this and I'm supposed to do that, but I, I prefer not to. So sometimes I have to bite the bullet for that. But uh, I try to work with them because I know, you know, some of the things that they're going through with their relative who's in the hospital. One last example, Luke. And there was this other guy who snapped at me. I kind of knew the situation about his son. His son had been here for a long time. And from what I hear, his son had got into a fight and he was paralyzed. That's why he got, that's why he got here. And he was in a coma and he wasn't coming out of the coma. And I heard how he got that way. He got into a fight with a black guy and the black guy really, well, you know, because he's here. Well, I guess his father felt a little angry toward blacks, and I went and cleaned his room, kid's room. His father would stay here every day, all day, but he smoked cigarettes. So he had went out to smoke a cigarette, and after I cleaned the room, he came back up to the room. I ran into him in the hall, and he just freaked out, telling me I didn't do it. I didn't clean the room and all this stuff. And at first, I got on the defensive. I was going to argue with him. But I don't know, something caught me and I said, I'm sorry, I'll go clean the room now. And the interviewer says, so you cleaned it again? 
Luke says, yeah, I cleaned it so he could see me clean it. I can understand how he could be. It was like six months that his son was here. He'd be a little frustrated, and so I cleaned it again. But I wasn't angry with him. I guess I could understand. So these are three examples from many uh, janitors telling, describing the work they do every day. And what's salient about these examples, all of them, is that in the three-page description of the job of a custodian level two, not a single task mentions another human being. None of this is part of their job as defined by the people who, who employ them and, uh, and supervise them. So, what are we to make of these choices by Grootman, by Simon, by the teachers, by the custodians? They're not the knock your socks off moral choices that we often teach in ethics classes, you know, the ones about abortion or euthanasia or plagiarism. They're examples of small, common choices that are embedded in everyday practices. But they're deeply ethical choices about when to be honest and how honest to be, about who should decide for a patient or a client, the patient's autonomy versus the professional's benevolence, or some would say paternalism, about what's fair treatment for students, about how to handle an unjust and maybe racially motivated accusation. So how do we make these everyday ethical choices? Well, one thing we do is we turn to rules and principles. They provide us with anchors, with guidelines. Be patient, be honest, be kind, respect the patient's autonomy, give the patient choice would be examples of such rules or principles. But such rules or principles are almost never enough. And philosophers from Aristotle to Dewey and Wallace and have reminded us of this. Rules by themselves fail us. There are a couple of reasons for that. I'll mention three, actually. First, there's no rule or principle, no rule or principle, which tells us which rule or principle is relevant in a particular case. Is this a case which calls for honesty? Or is this a case which calls for kindness? No rule that tells us that. Second, principles often conflict with each other. How do you choose between letting a patient decide and paternalistically nudging a patient to pick the treatment you think is best? Or if you're a parent, for example, between letting your kids make their own choices and learning to be independent or deciding for them and keeping them safe. There's often no meta rule that decides between conflicting principles. Third, they fail us because how do you apply a rule in any particular rule in any particular case? There's no rule to tell you how to be honest, even if you know you need to be honest. There's no rule to tell you how to grade fairly, even if you're disposed to grade fairly. We don't need to belabor this. All of you know the problem with simply following rules because we all find ourselves saying from time to time, oh, there's an exception to every rule. Aristotle captured the problem, I think, and the solution with a famous metaphor of his uh, it's his metaphor of the lesbian rule, using that somewhat differently than we would use it today. Aristotle was particularly fascinated with how the Masons on the Isle of Lesbos used a ruler. A normal straight edge ruler allows you to measure the length of a piece of wood or stone that has to be cut. But what do you do when you're carving out a round column from a slab of stone and you need to measure the circumference? The Masons on Lesbos figured out a way to bend the rule by fashioning a flexible ruler out of lead, which of course is a forerunner of today's tape measure. And Aristotle uses that idea of the lesbian rule to get the, across the idea of the straight edge that can be bent. If rules fail as a guide, perhaps virtues might do the trick. Well, yes and no. In the last 30 years, there's been a great revival in Aristotelian ethics, a challenge to the rule and procedure-based ethics that many of you may have studied when you studied Kant or utilitarianism. The primary concern in virtue ethics is with a person's character. 
enduring traits or virtues that guide a good life. Doing the right thing on this view is first and foremost a question of being a certain kind of person, of being habitually disposed to be brave or caring or loyal or generous. On this view, virtues are learned dispositions to act in certain ways, and they are guides, not rules. Moreover, they're anchored in emotion, not juxtaposed to emotions as rules are in modern ethical theories. They point us to the right thing. They point us to be loyal and be fair and be kind. And we desire, there's where the emotion comes in, we desire to do the right thing because it's the right thing, because it's the aim of the practice. We learn to do the right thing, says Aristotle, and for the right reasons. It's such virtues that guide Dr. Groupman in wanting to give Maxine hope and trying to be honest with her and kind too. It's because lawyer William Simon embodies fairness in his character that he's outraged at the injustice done Mrs. Jones. It's because he is respectful of her autonomy that he wants her to choose whether to accept the plea bargain. So the classic alternative to rules, character. But these virtues of good character are not enough either, even as a supplement to rules. They aim us in the right direction. They make us well-intentioned, but they too are only guides. Without something else, they don't tell us when and how to balance kindness with honesty or when loyalty deteriorates into blind loyalty or how to be fair. That was why Aristotle was so insistent that we also know how to find what he called the mean. Courage, he famously said, was not just fearlessness in the face of death. And retreating from the battlefield was not always cowardice. When he said that courage was the mean, or the balance point, between recklessness and too much fear, he was telling us that we need the knowledge. We need the knowledge to find the balance in the context of the particular circumstance. Sometimes we need to stand firm, but it would be recklessness, not, recklessness, not courage, to risk our lives in vain. Sometimes we need to flee to fight another day. Virtues like rules fail as a solution to ethical choices absent something else, and that something else, not surprisingly, given the topic of our lecture, is practical wisdom. Aristotle called it phronesis. It was for him a kind of master virtue, one that gave order and coherence and direction to all the other virtues, that transformed them from from unruly children into a steady adult or that turned cacophony into a symphony. This practical wisdom demanded more than just moral will, more than just the disposition, the wanting to do something. It, the dem it demanded a kind of expertise, a moral skill. So you can't be virtuous, benevolent, brave, fair, honest, without practical wisdom. And the same holds true for rules. You don't know what rule to apply or what to do when two principles conflict without practical wisdom. So, okay, what then is practical wisdom? Well, it's a bit elusive, we have to say. And simple definitions don't tell us much, although you learn a lot from looking at individual cases. We could say, very abstractly, that it's the capacity to know the right thing to do in a particular circumstance and the motivation and courage to actually do it. We could say, rightly, that it's good judgment or horse sense or ethical intelligence. Our grandmothers would have listened to our philosophical jabber and said, ah, I know what you mean. It's being a mensch. Elusive as it is, we can say something about the moral abilities that such a wise person or a mensch has. First, a wise person knows that no two patients, no two students, no two clients are alike. So rules and standard procedures must always be crafted to the circumstances. For example, a wise person knows when and how to make an exception to every rule. A wise person knows when and how to be virtuous, when and how to be kind, for example. Secondly, a wise person knows how to balance conflicting virtues and conflicting rules, how to find the mean, not just between courage and recklessness, but between empathy and detachment or between fairness, treating all students alike, and giving this unique individual what she deserves. Third, 
A wise person knows how to improvise, like a good jazz musician. Real world problems are often ambiguous and ill-defined, and the context is always changing, so circumstances always demand ethical improvisation. Fourth, a wise person can take the perspective of another to see the situation as she does, to understand how she feels. This perspective taking is what enables wise people to feel empathy for others. Fifth, a wise person aims at the right things, at the purpose of the activity he or she is engaged in. These aims turn out to be crucial guides in figuring out what the right thing to do is in this particular circumstance. In fact, it's these very aims of a practice that often motivate the wise person not only to do the right thing, but to do it for the right reason. Uh, and notice something else here. This means that wisdom is not just about judging. It's about doing, right? or our expression, the common expression we would have. It's not just about talking the talk. It's about walking the walk. Finally, a wise person is an experienced person. People learn how to be brave, said Aristotle, not by studying in our classes, but by doing brave things, although some people say that's a brave thing to do. They learn, just has ha they learn it just as musicians learn improvisation in jazz, through the experience of improvising. But it's not just any experience that teaches the skills of moral improvisation. Developing wisdom requires that people be able to take initiative, to make mistakes, to learn from mistakes. To summarize, practical wisdom is an ethical intelligence and ethical motivation. It's the moral skill and the moral will we all need to make ethical choices. Aiming at the right thing and desiring it is critical that's the moral will, moral expertise or moral skill gives us the know-how to hit the mark. So now that you all know, know what, uh, what wisdom is, sort of, I'm going to talk to you about why we are engaged in a war on wisdom, uh, which is hard to understand since it would seem to me, and I hope to you, that this is the sort of thing we want every doctor, lawyer, and teacher we ever encounter to be like, and we want to be like this ourselves. So why make war on wisdom? Well, the answer to that is that no one is deliberately making war on wisdom. There is a stealth war on wisdom, um, and we might subtitle this section, The Dangerous Allure of Carrots and Sticks. Um, if practical wisdom is rooted in experience, we have a problem. The kinds of experiences that professionals face in their daily work threaten to corrode the very wisdom they need to do the work well. We think that one of the major reasons for this is that managers, administrators, and policymakers reach for the wrong tools when they try to solve problems. They reach for carrots and sticks, incentives and rules, in an effort to change the behavior of professionals. But the more professionals rely on rules and external incentives, the more the wisdom they need is endangered. And I will give you a few examples. First, uh, a couple of examples of the war on moral skill. The first one is titled Lemonade. I heard this on an NPR uh, radio show uh, called Mo uh, Saturday Edition. Um, some of you may have heard it too. One day early this past spring, a father, a professor of archaeology at the University of Michigan, took his seven-year-old to a Detroit Tigers game. And let me just say parenthetically, I appreciate all of your congratulations on the uh, result of the World Series. Um, a few innings into the game, his son asked for a glass of lemonade. The dad dutifully went to a concession stand to get some. Mike's hard lemonade, which is 5% alcohol, was all they had. And the dad, never having heard of it, bought some and brought it. While they were cheering on the tigers, a, a, a frustrating experience, a security guard happened to notice the child sipping lemonade from the bottle. He called the cops, who in turn called an ambulance. The ambulance came to the ballpark and rushed the child to the hospital. Luckily, he had no trace of alcohol in him, and the doctors were ready to discharge him. But no, not so fast.
the cops put the child in a Wayne County Child Protective Services foster home. They hated to do it, but they had to follow procedure. County officials kept him there for three days. They also hated to do it, but they also had to follow procedure. Next, a judge ruled that the child could go home, finally, to his mom, but only if his dad left the house and checked into a hotel. The judge hated to do it, but he had to follow procedure. After two weeks, the family finally was reunited. In telling this story on, uh, on Morning Edition, Scott Simon observed that, quote, procedures may be dumb, but they spare you from thinking. And to be fair, procedures are often imposed because previous officials have been lax and let a child go back to an abusive household. I mean, let's be fair. So that's one example. Second example is the case of Judge Lois Forer, who was a uh, a judge in the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas Criminal Division, and she encountered the case of Michael, which appeared quite routine. Typical offender, young, black, and male, high school dropout without a job. The charge was an insignificant holdup that occasioned no comment in the press, and the trial itself was, in the busy life of a judge, a very run-of-the-mill event. The year before, Michael, brandishing a toy gun, held up a taxi and took $50 from the driver and the passenger, harming neither. This was Michael's first offense. Though he had dropped out of school to marry his pregnant girlfriend, Michael later obtained a high school equivalency diploma. He'd been steadily employed, earning enough to send his daughter to parochial school, a considerable sacrifice for him and his wife. Shortly before the holdup, Michael had lost his job. Despondent because he could not support his family, he went out on a Saturday night, had more than a few drinks, and then robbed the taxi. Four, quote, there was no doubt that Michael was guilty, but the penalty posed problems. The prosecutor wanted a five-year sentence. So Four returned to Pennsylvania's sentencing guidelines, a state statute designed to give similar sentences to offenders who commit similar crimes. The minimum sentence prescribed by the guidelines was 24 months. Four, I decided to deviate from the guidelines, sentencing Michael to 11 and a half months in the county jail, permitting him to work outside prison during the day to support his family. My rationale for the lesser penalty outlined in my lengthy opinion was that this was a first offense, no one was harmed, Michael acted under the pressures of unemployment and need, and he seemed truly contrite. He'd never committed a violent act and posed no danger to the public. A sentence of close to a year seemed adequate to convince Michael of the seriousness of his crime. So she sentenced him to less than a year. Her sentence was extended on appeal. Judge Forer resigned from the bench. Third example is the story of Christine Javari, a kindergarten teacher in Chicago. She began her 53rd day teaching at Chicago's Joyce Kilmer Elementary School with a clear lesson plan. She opened a thick white binder on her desk to day 53. 26,000 other Chicago teachers had identical binders crammed with goals, conversation starters, and step-by-step -step questions. What Ms. Jabari saw was this, script for day 53, title, reading and enjoying literature slash words with B, text, the bath, lecture, assemble students on the rug or reading area, give students a warning about the dangers of hot water, say, listen very quietly as I read the story, say, think of other pictures that make the same sound as the sound bath begins with. I could read you all of the script. Unfortunately, there are 75 items after the ones I just read for teaching five-year-olds the bath. So these are three examples of people who are following rules, well-intentioned rules, right? You follow procedures so that parents won't abuse their children again. You have uh, sentencing guidelines. 
to eliminate in, in, in what seem to be inequities in criminal sentencing. You have these rules in the classroom because you don't trust teachers to be able to use their judgment to form lessons plans on their own. Now imagine a similar set of rules that governed the behavior of the janitors whose examples I described to you before. All of the activities I described, they would no longer engage in. Why? Because none of the activities they engage in are part of their job. Wisdom is learned, but it can't be taught. That is, to become wise, people must try, fail, learn from their failures, and try again. R rules are designed to prevent mistakes, and rightly so. Some mistakes are just too serious and must be prevented. But the price that's paid for too many rules is that they deprive people of the opportunity to learn from their mistakes, which in turn undermines the ability to improvise, to find solutions to problems that rules cover imperfectly or not at all. And if you accept uh, what Ken said to you a few minutes ago, which is that virtually all situations are situations that rules cover imperfectly or not at all, anything that in impedes people's ability to improvise is likely to produce disastrous results. The reliance on rules is a war against mistakes. It's a war against trial and error. It's a war against discretion. It's a war against judgment, all of it well-intentioned. And it is self-reinforcing, not self-correcting. The more you take moral skill out of practices, the less wise practitioners will become. And the less wise practitioners become, the more rules you will need to create to make sure that they do the right thing. So this is how rules, that is to say sticks, are waging a war on moral skill. Now let's talk about incentives and the war on moral will. If not rules, then what? Let's come up with clever incentives that will induce people to do the right thing. Now we know that it's easy to give people incentives to do the wrong thing. But when we see such things, our response tends to be, well, some dummy set up these bad incentives. Just let me in, I'll roll up my sleeves, and I'll change the incentives so that instead of getting paid off for doing bad things, you get paid off for doing good things. Fair enough, but even good incentives fail. And I'll give you one lovely example of this. There are many. Uh, this is a, a true case that occurred in a daycare center in Israel. Here is the problem. Parents were coming late to pick up their kids. The daycare center closed at 6. They were coming at 6.10, 6.15. It was discourteous. The teachers couldn't very well leave the kids sitting on the stoop and lock the door. Um, and, there, and, you know, no amount of appeal to the parents to show up on time was seeming to have any effect. So the director of the daycare center had a very clever idea, and they introduced a fine. If you come late, you pay a fine. Guess what happened? Lateness increased. Increased. Why? Because a fine which is meant to convey a message that you are misbehaving, you are transgressing, was interpreted by parents not as a fine, but as a price. And it was a price worth paying. Now, no doubt you could make the fine high enough so that it wouldn't be a price worth paying. But the important point is that by giving a fine to parents, you essentially legitimized their coming late. I know the rules. If I'm willing to pay the fine, I can come whenever I get there, and 15 bucks for an extra half hour in the office is well worth it to me. A fine is not a price, says the title of the paper, but who said a fine is not a price? If you interpret a fine as a price and you're willing to pay the price, then this very clever incentive can end up actually having an effect that's opposite to the effect that it previously had. And here's another interesting thing about this. Um, since it didn't work, they stopped the fines. Guess what? Lateness continued to be worse than it was before because they had demoralized lateness. And having demoralized it, you can't remoralize it simply by taking the financial incentives away. They had permanently altered the moral status of this behavior in the minds of parents.
I don't know about permanently, but at least for six months after this fine regimen, the lateness problem persisted. So that's one example. Another example that we all know about is teaching to the test. No child left behind, standards, 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 accountability, 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 uh, all well-intentioned maybe, or at least not evilly intentioned, but the results are somewhere between bad and awful. And one reason why, as somebody, wise person once said, is be careful what you measure, because what you measure is what you'll get. And that's certainly what we have seen in dramatic cases where teachers actually cheat to make sure the kids do well, to less dramatic cases where teachers simply teach what's going to be on the test without concern for whether or not this is what their kids actually need to uh, actually need to learn. There's a wonderful example that Ken recently encountered where teachers were advised in dealing with individual students to pay all of their attention to kids who are, quote, on the bubble. Meaning what? Meaning they're not going to pass the test without special attention, but they're close enough to passing the test that if you give them special attention, you'll nudge them over the right side of the line. Don't waste your time with kids who are far from the bubble because they're still not going to make it, and your critical objective is to get as many kids to pass the test as you possibly can. So select the kids who are on the bubble and nudge them in the right direction. There's a general uh, description of this incentivization. It's called moral crowding out. You take behavior that could occur for moral reasons because it's the right thing to do, and when you incentivize it, it stops, the question of right or wrong stops being relevant, and the question instead becomes, is this in my interest or not? And you implicitly sanction thinking about it in those terms when you incentivize activities in this way. So even good incentives can have a bad effect. The responses that we have seen so far from public officials to the collapse of our financial system are a perfect example of what we're talking about. Lots of people have lots of ideas about how to fix the problem in the short run, and plenty of people have ideas about how to fix the problem in the long run. I've been reading a lot about this. Every single idea have, I have seen falls into one of two categories. We need better regulations, or we need smarter incentives. Better rules, smarter incentives, and from now on, bankers will be bankers instead of being whatever it is they were for the last 10 years. No mention, no mention at all that there is uh, the possibility of solving this problem or mitigating it by remoralizing the activities that these financial folks have engaged in. Each set of rules and incentives is a response to past failures of previous rules and incentives. But the problem is that water will find any crack. There is no set of rules. There is no set of incentives that are clever enough and subtle enough to prevent people from subverting them if people are not inclined to do the right thing because it's the right thing. And thus there is, a, again, a downward spiral. Both rules and incentives behave a lot like addiction. If you are an alcoholic and you wake up hungover, at 7 o'clock in the morning, how do you treat the hangover? You take another drink. This is an effective way to eliminate the hangover in the short run. But as we all know, in the long run, it makes the problem worse. Rules and incentives may be effective ways to treat problems in the short run, but Ken and, Ken's and my view is that in the long run, like taking another drink, they make the problem they are designed to correct worse. But if you think about the institutions these practices live in, the HMOs, the construction firms, the law firms, and even many universities, uh, they, those institutions may share some of the intrinsic aims of the professions, but those institutions also need to stay afloat. They need to worry about external goods like gain, like glory, status, and power. So there's a built-in tension, if you think about it, between the practices of the professions and the institutions those practices live in. The professions can only survive inside of those organizations, but those organizations often aim at different, very contradictory things. Can these tensions be managed? Well, the last three decades have shown how hard this is. We've witnessed the twin forces of mammoth size, as you've gotten these 
mega medical institutions and mega law firms and mega universities. Uh, the twin forces of mammoth size and market competition create a logic to control the behavior of professionals with exactly the carrots and sticks that we've said have been so dangerous. If we have time later, we can talk about how large hierarchical organizations might reform to nurture character and wisdom. We've got examples, uh, for instance, of how school systems in Vermont and in San Diego have found ways to improve standards but without standardization. That's a, a good discussion. We don't want to go there exactly right now. Right now, what we want to briefly reflect on is another front in stemming the attack on wisdom, which is what can professional schools like those here at Mercer do? How can they develop practitioners dedicated and wise enough to practice well, but also wise enough to resist some of these corrosive forces? How do you encourage dedication and wisdom in students that you're sending out into a rather cruel world? Barry mentioned the paradox before, and I'll restate that, because it's an important paradox for teachers or educational planners, I think, to remember. That paradox is this, that wisdom can be learned, but wisdom can't be taught. That wisdom can be learned, but that wisdom can't be taught. So if you start there, you know, you're tempted to like pack up your bags and go home because <laughs> what are you going to do at a professional school, right? But let's unpack this for a minute. Remember that a wise professional aims at the right things and has ethical expertise or know-how to handle situations that are almost always difficult and ambiguous. If you just hold that thought in your mind, you, you can see why you can't just teach somebody moral know-how. Uh, but does that mean nothing can be done in the classroom? Well, no, because teachers, although they can't teach it, like with well, a lecture, all right, with a, with a book, with a test, teachers can structure experiences at least to teach elements of practical wisdom. And there are lots of examples of that, many of which you already, uh, already know or may have heard of. There's the example, for instance, of a pilot project at Harvard, which actually uh, Dr. Jerome Groupman helped advise, which assigns first-year students to faculty members to serve as mentors and match the students with a patient that the students are tasked to follow for a year. They write a case book about the patient and her disease, not only about the genetics of the disease and the treatment option, but also about the patient's emotions, suffering, financial difficulties, and family situation. There are examples of law schools that organize hands-on law clinics that mentor students in practical wisdom by exposing them to real, ill-structured, ambiguous cases. The students aren't just role-playing the plaintiff or the defendant and the judge, but taking responsibility for real people not names in a case book. There are examples of professional schools that use narratives and stories to teach wisdom. Professor uh, Martha Nussbaum has a lovely analysis in her little book, highly readable book, unlike most of her other books, called Poetic Justice. Poetic Justice, which is about her experience using novels at the University of Chicago Law School to help lawyers-to-be understand other people, she says, from the inside, to appreciate what a situation and the people in it require. Dr. Rita Sharon at Columbia University Medical School has her medical students keep a parallel chart, a notebook in which they write down their feelings about a patient they are working with, and then this becomes an integral part of teaching doctors to be perceptiveness and empathy in the literary narratives course she teaches at the medical school. Stories can serve another function, too. Whether fictional or real, they can provide moral exemplars, prototypes that motivate and guide us. They put in our minds an image of what work well done looks like, an image of what a good professional looks like. It could be an exemplary figure from a book or a movie, the lawyer Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird comes to mind. Or it could be exemplary figures from history. For John F. Kennedy, for example, it was the great senators like Daniel Webster and Robert Taft that he wrote about in his book, Profiles and Courage. When we just train our students in the massive, ever-growing body of technical detail they need to know, there's always a risk 
This can inadvertently demoralize young professionals. Finding ways to keep aspirational exemplars at the center, even while we do the technical training, can sustain the commitment many students start with and help remoralize the professions. Our guess is that there is already a lot of local knowledge right here at Mercer about how to structure experience which teach, it, which teach and encourage practical wisdom, and indeed there'll be a workshop for some of you tomorrow that's all about that. Simply talking at a university across programs and across disciplines, simply talking about what's already being done can trigger all sorts of ideas. But let me mention and illustrate three characteristics we've observed about what might be called wisdom-inducing experiences that can take place at universities. So characteristic number one, wisdom-inducing experiences give students practice in reflecting upon their experiences and reflecting upon their experiences with each other and with teachers. How did you make that tough call? You can ask. Why did you shade the truth in this way with that patient? Why didn't you tell that client about plea bargaining after you told them about the dangerous consequences of going to trial and losing? Notice that such reflection takes part together. It's not just teachers critiquing and suggesting. It's not just teachers lecturing. So we need to find ways to help teachers teach judgment without being judgmental which itself takes more than a modicum of wisdom. Characteristic number two, wisdom-inducing experiences are ones in which the possibility for trial and error is built in. Dr. Grootman tells this story about learning to deliver bad news. Claire Allen was a small, straw-haired librarian in her 40s with breast cancer. She was married with two young children. Grootman remembers his discussion with her. We met in my clinic office and she looked at me expectantly. Claire, with a disease, a remission would ordinarily, with a disease like this, a remission would ordinarily last three to six months, I told her bluntly. A person could expect to survive between one to two years. She appeared to take the news stalwartly, but I later learned from her husband that she'd left the appointment deeply shaken. She told her children that she only had one Christmas left. Her face was full of despair whenever I saw her. Yet Claire lived for nearly four years. She was able to travel, work part-time, and take care of her children, but was unable to stop thinking that she could die at any moment. Chastened, said Grootman, I tried a different approach. Henry Gold, a short-order cook in his 60s, had acute leukemia that had resisted all treatment. At one point, he asked me what else could be done. I reassured him that there were drugs that had not yet been tried, even though I knew they were unlikely to help. When Henry started to bleed around his lungs, I had interns draining the hemorrhage with chest tubes. I insisted he be intubated. I supported on a respirator in the ICU and given numerous blood transfusions. I never asked Henry what he wanted. He stayed alive for more than a week on the respirator, a catheter in his heart, tubes in his throat, unable to speak to his family and friends who had come to his bedside. Grootman characterizes these decisions as what he calls early blunders, but they're not surprising. It's difficult, he says, for doctors to deliver bad news. Some don't want to acknowledge their patient is going to die. There's always some possibility that one more test, one more procedure. Some lack the courage, he said, to face their patient's anguish at news of imminent death. Conventional wisdom until recently was keep the patient optimistic. It takes some wisdom to build such experiences into our teaching. Think of the delicate balance. We don't want professionals to make mistakes, but the only way they'll learn practical wisdom is by learning from their mistakes. We need to build experiences where students are both trained and motivated to get it right, where they feel safe to exercise discretion and make mistakes, there are a number of interesting programs being tried at medical schools now where you actually bring in professional actors trained to be patients, have the students work with those actors and let them make the mistakes. But doing programs like that demand an organizational structure that actually builds trust between faculty and students, 
where everyone takes at least some responsibility for the mistakes and where fear of punishment does not give the student an incentive to hide or cover up or dissemble. The last characteristic is this. We need to be modeling proper motivations and moral skills ourselves as teachers. Grootman reflects on his own experience as an intern and resident. He says, during my nine years of medical school and professional training in the 1970s, I was never instructed in how to speak about dying to a gravely ill patient and a patient's family. It was presumed that as medical students, we learned how to deliver bad news through careful observation of our mentors just as we learned how to lance a deep abscess by watching doctors and then trying it ourselves. But most physicians, he said, preferred to speak to their patients in private, and the subject was never raised in our classrooms. The Gutman story highlights a second paradox. Though wisdom can't be taught, we as teachers are actually teaching it all the time. When we go in front of a class, when we advise students in our offices, when we grade their papers, we are role models whether we want to be or not. When we choose who to call on in class or whose answers to criticize and what tone to use, we're modeling fairness. When we listen to students, when we choose whether to ask a question or to tell, we're demonstrating how to balance empathy and detachment. When we choose who to interrupt, and how to interrupt them, we're demonstrating when patience or impatience is justified. When a student challenges our conclusions or points to our mistakes, our response will be a model for how people deal with error, with uncertainty, with criticism. And when we blow it, as we inevitably do, we can take comfort in Will Rogers' famous aphorism. The only way to learn good judgment, he said, is through experience. And most of that experience is the exercise of bad judgment. Barry, you want to finish up? I'm just going to wrap up. Um, if you're convinced about the importance of wisdom and that there's a war against it, the question is what can we do about it? How can we defend it in our professions? Is the best defense a good offense? We think we have a few ideas along these lines, uh, and I'll lay out for you, but these are very tentative. The first thing to do is to appreciate the importance of practical wisdom and to be able to defend it in words and argument. Encouraging wisdom is not a central aim of most academic and professional institutions, and that, I think, is an understatement. We have to be able to show what it is and why it is critical to being a professional. It's not an add-on. It is not something that is nice to have along with technical expertise. Rather, we can't serve others unless we know what service is, unless we know what to aim at, unless we have the moral expertise to act on these aims with this particular person in this particular context. And unless we have the will, the moral will, the motivation to do it. Our sense is that the last three years that you all have spent here at Mercer talking about uh, the values and virtues of professionalism have made very important strides in this direction. Second thing we need to do is to engage management and administration and help them figure out ways to nurture wisdom instead of undermining it. The institution, as Ken pointed out, the institutions we practice in are always in tension with the professions we practice. They need gain, they need glory, they need power to survive. Our professions aim at caring for the human body and spirit, in protecting safety and promoting health, in promoting happiness and minimizing suffering and pain, in educating minds and hearts. But we can't practice these professions outside of the institutions that support them. And, these, inst and the, these institutions will implode, just like the market has imploded, if they undermine the virtues and the wisdom that are a part of our of practice when we are practicing well. We must take the lead in managing this ongoing tension 
And that demands not only commitment, but organization and struggle. A good first step, we think, would be to understand what demotivates and de-skills us as teachers. What are the structures in our own schools that are undermining or diverting us from the goods of teaching, getting us to aim at the wrong things or corroding our motivation? What are the structures that are undermining our moral skills? Is it class size? Is it lack of contact with students? Uh, is it a system of rules and incentives that prioritizes research and makes students seem a threat to advancement? If we are to be the kind of reflective practitioners that uh, Donald Schoen has written about and William Sullivan has written about, that reflection has to begin at home with the practice of teaching and the policies and structures that shape it. To manage this tension, to encourage virtue and wisdom, there's a third thing we need to do. We need to resist the temptation to confront every problem by reaching into our toolkit and pulling out another carrot or another stick. Incentives and rules can change behavior, but they risk corrupting our expert, ethical expertise and will. We need first to ask, what will this carrot or stick do to the moral incentives and moral skill that people need to do the right thing? And we also need to ask, can training, counseling, mentoring, or modeling solve the problem better? The golden rule of not using rules or incentives is this. The rules and incentives shouldn't be tools, should be tools of last resort. Try character and wisdom first. The final thing we need to do, uh, and this is implicit in everything else, is to pay attention to remoralizing the professions, not only with what we teach, but with the kind of experiences we encourage. And not only this, but by what we model, by the examples we set. We can create classes and exercises and experiences that encourage our students to be virtuous and wise. We can hash out and even commit ourselves to common ideas of service and vocation and professions. But we can't forget the central paradox. Wisdom can't be taught, yet we are teaching it in almost every encounter we have with our students. We need to reflect on how to become wiser teachers if we are serious about having our professional students learn wisdom from us. And again, they are going to learn something from us. What we want is for that something to be wisdom. In the words of that famous, if uh, under-recognized and until recently under-appreciated uh, neo-Aristotelian Karl Marx, in his, uh, he, Karl Marx has come back into vogue in the last few weeks, uh, he wrote, quote, the educators themselves must be educated. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. That was absolutely terrific, and what a wonderful challenge uh, to the group and for our exercise tomorrow. I want to thank you for one move you make specifically, and that is that uh, Aristotle's solution to uh, moral motivation is something you've heard your entire life, and that is virtue is its own reward. Uh, that was fine for Aristotle because everybody wanted to become the Athenian gentleman, and uh, that was the moral motivation. You didn't even need to ask the question, why do you want to be moral? Well, what they have done is taken the idea that virtue is, uh, as I understand it, that virtue is its own reward and spelled out a social implication of that, that not a move that Aristotle was even capable of making, I think. The social implication is that if virtue is its own reward, you should treat people as if virtue is its own reward. And the, as you just heard, the, the social implications of that are dramatic and hopeful. And uh, thank you so much for that. Um, look forward to seeing as many of you as we can tomorrow uh, at the law school. Mark, Peter, any additional instructions? Okay.
Yes, Mark. I mean, that's a very good point, and you're certainly right. Uh, uh, rules and incentives, as you put it, simplify complexity. Now, it should be said, I think most people who develop rules and incentives don't think they are, they don't think they're simplifying complexity in a way that does damage. You know, there are surface details that are of a, no real consequence. We're getting to the heart of the matter and constructing just the rules and incentives that will allow us to achieve what we want from doctors, lawyers, teachers, bankers, and so on. And there are other things that simplify complexity, and although we have no intention of discussing this, you're quite right that ideology is one such thing. Uh, you know, everything that happens in a very complex world gets shoved into some ideology and interpreted through that lens. And what that does is it, I think, essentially paralyzes you and makes it impossible for you to come up with wise solutions to complicated problems. Um, I, I, I think we see some of that in the current uh, political debate where there's uh, uh, more ideology at the moment on one side than the other, although people think that the non-ideologue -ideolo actually has a hidden ideology. We'll find out, I guess, in a few months. Um, so yeah, if you think, um, if you, if all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail, and if you've got a Marxist ideology, then everything is a struggle, a class struggle, and if you've got a capitalist ideology, then any, everything is about letting markets run free and unfettered. And the world is way too complicated for any ideology that anyone has come up with. So I think that is another, another example. Now, shedding ideology does not produce wisdom. But it's, I don't know that you can be wise and ideological. Because to be wise is to appreciate the priority of the particular. And to be ideological is to treat the particular as an instance of a much larger class. So... In that sense, I think they are, no matter what the ideology, I think they're incompatible. But let me just say one other thing. Rules are important. Rules, without rules, we're completely at sea. We're at a loss. We don't know where to begin. And that may be true of ideology as well. It gets you started. It gives you a set of tools with which to grapple with a complicated actual case. Rules give you a set of moral concerns with which to grapple with a complex actual case. But then you got to know that the time comes to leave the rules or the ideology behind, behind and appreciate the complexity of the particular case that's before you. So we don't want to suggest that uh, eliminating rules is feasible or possible or desirable by no means. It's just not the last word on any significant human problem. Yes, exactly. When to use the rules, when to deviate from the rules, when to throw the rule book away altogether. Think about the, think about the, um, the great recent seven-volume neo-Aristotelian text by uh, Rawlings, Harry Potter. Okay? And think about, just think for a minute about what would happen at Hogwarts if there were no rules. There would be chaos. I mean, Harry Potter, that, that entire school of wizardry that you or your kids or you through your kids or some combination um, may have been reading about would fall apart if there weren't the point systems for Gryffindor, Gryffindor or for Slytherin or for what. But at the heart of that book are Ron and Hermione and Harry who are rule breakers. That's what they do. They break rules. Some rules. Some of the time. 
And in part, what they're learning to do as we go through that seven volume series is they're learning which rules to break, when, and how. And they're doing that by sometimes being punished for rule breaking and sometimes not. They're being done by having a safety net that the wise wizard Dumbledore puts underneath them so when they fall too far, he can, he can catch them. They're given the equivalent of uh, Plato's, uh, the Gyges ring in Plato's Republic, which is the invisibility cloak that they can put on so that they don't have rules and incentives to stop them, right? They can be invisible in terms of what they do. And when they're invisible, they have to learn to do the right things for the right reasons because there's no fear of punishment and no, um, and no immediate reward. So the whole book is about the tension to some extent. It's about many things, about tons of things. Everybody can read into Harry Potter what they want. But I'm reading into it right now, this particular point, about the necessity of having rules and incentives, right? Because you get 50 points. Not just you're punished, you get 50 points. It's about rules and incentives, carrots and sticks. You've got to have them, but you also have to find ways when you're educating people to learn when and how to break them. And they're running a school like that, like running any of your professional schools, and finding that kind of balance is going to take some wisdom. Any, any other questions? Yes. I'm Ken. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. I think it's – Barry and I have grappled with this a lot, uh, up to the point that we've even argued, argued about the word um, uh, know-how. We, we tend to talk about moral skill as opposed to moral know-how or moral expertise. But I think know-how is appropriate to some extent because it puts it in the context of the know-how of a craftsman. It, that, that the ability to move from the general to the particular – to actually figure out what to do in a particular instance is a kind of expertise or know-how which is analogous to the expertise or know-how of a craftsman. But for a craftsman to be a good craftsman, a carpenter or a jeweler or a house builder or a navigator, they have to know something about the why. They have to know something about the purpose of an activity. They have to know something about the reason behind it. I mean, the the, the Aristotelian or Greek language would be they have to know something about the telos, the aim or purpose of something. Because if not, they don't have a framework which guides the how. They just have a technique. They have a technical skill, but no, it might be a moral technical skill, but they have no sense of how to apply it. And if they're not applying it with rules, it's got to always be that they're applying it aiming at a purpose and knowing why this is the good thing to do. So the, the how and the why we think are together. But in saying that, I should underline that, that our understanding of practical wisdom or how we have chosen to interpret Aristotle for our own purposes in dealing with practical wisdom is not the way others talk about practical wisdom. Um, w one, of the, one of the wonderful speakers that you had here right before us, well, not right before us, a year ago, William May, when he talks about practical wisdom, he looks at it uh, as discernment, as perception. He emphasizes its importance in getting at the particular, but it, he does not build into his, the notion of practical wisdom that why or the purpose or the, or the telos. That's part of other things that professionals need to uh, need to learn. For, for, for us, you can't have the how without the why. If you just have, if you'll indulge me for another second, if you just have the how and not the why, then you could get Voldemort 
or Tom Riddle in Harry Potter or Iago in Othello. If you think about people like, who should I use in this audience? Should we do Othello or Harry Potter? Or, no, which is the, or both? <laughs> or Machiavelli. It, it, the thing about Iago is that he can fake friendship with Othello. And for him to be able to do it, just like Tom Riddle, a.k.a. Voldemort, can fake friendship in volume two of Harry Potter, it's because they actually are empathetic. They have the technique or the skill, the know-how to be empathetic. They can get inside somebody. They can understand their hearts and their minds. But without the why, without the purpose, without the appropriate aim, they can use that for great evil. They can use that for the purpose of manipulation. So untethered know-how can be extraordinarily dangerous. So to come back to where you started, I would say the why, the aim, the purpose is critical, and that for us practical wisdom brings both of those together. Let me just add a, couple of, a few little things. Aristotle is the great an analyzer, but my reading as a very amateur reader of Aristotle is that he'd probably be appalled at the notion that you can separate how and why. We do it partly because in modern social science, how is about the cognitive you know, expertise and why is about motivation. And for 100 years, psychologists have talked about motivation, which is what gets you moving, and then the actual action, which depends on specific learning. But it's an, in the case of wisdom, it's an artificial distinction, at least from Aristotle's point of view. And one way of seeing this is that Aristotle says, you can't be wise without the other virtues. But you can't have the other virtues unless you're wise. Now, say that sentence to an audience of social scientists, and they will never let you come back into the room, because that's nonsense. You know, what the hell does that mean? So we try to avoid those elegant and um, impenetrable locutions and simplify for purposes of presentation. So it's not know-how. It's know-how and know-why, and you need them both to be wise. And at least conceptually, we understand the difference, uh, even though wise people have them seamlessly uh, to, to connected. Uh, I want to say one other thing about, about, about this notion of remoralizing the professions. Um, remoralizing is a nice term because it means two things, and we want it to mean both of those things. We think that people who work as professionals have lost morale because of the way they're forced to practice. So remoralizing means remotivating, rededicating. And remoralizing means reintroducing the moral dimension. And we think that if you remoralize in the second sense, you will remoralize in the first sense. And the reason we think that, this is an optimistic view, is that we don't think there are very many 10-year-olds who are walking around saying, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be just like John Woo. You, you, you or Wu? You, you, he taught my daughter constitutional law at Berkeley. She dropped out of the Berkeley Law School in six weeks. He was only part of the reason. Um, you know, people walk around thinking, I want to be Atticus Finch. That's my hero. They quickly get taught that that's a naive, embarrassing thing to admit, certainly to say out loud to other people, maybe even to say out loud to yourself. So that gets suppressed. Moral aims, aspirations to be like moral heroes get suppressed in the service of the development of cold, rational, technical expertise. And that's one reason why even people who make a lot of money, like lawyers, are demoralized. And if you gave them permission to walk around saying, I want to be like Atticus Finch, in fact, if you help them to become like Atticus Finch, then the problem of motivation, we think, would largely take care of itself. So we are not being naively optimistic, looking at a bunch of money-hungry people and saying, just leave them alone and they'll do the right thing. We've made them money-hungry people. You can't just leave them alone and they'll do the right thing, but you can re-nurture what got them interested in this in the first place and then have some confidence that they will, uh, that they will do the right thing. That at least is what what we believe, and that's what we think you all are really trying to do in all of the different professional schools that you're uh, thinking about changing. Long answer to a very provocative question.
Warren Buffett. That's a fabulous question, and I, I'll give you at least my best shot at an answer. Uh, we are dealing with shifting values, and uh, I have an economist friend who, use, who likes to say, don't tax people. Let people make money, and then when they're rich, they'll give their money to charity. Don't impede the market. It's much more efficient if you let the market do its thing and then trust that people like Warren Buffett, who in fact has already done this, will give their massive fortunes away. I think that Warren Buffett's attitude is that the whole point of investing, the telos of investing is only make money. I mean, don't break the law, that would be immoral. But there is only one aim, and that is to make money. And so you do that as well as you possibly can, and then other values will determine what you do with your billion, millions or billions uh, when the time comes. Now, that's a model that reflects current values, which is the point of the financial industry is to make money, full stop. You could imagine a different notion of what the point of the practice of finance is. So back in the days before we had a term, we had a distinction between the, quote, real economy and Wall Street. Think about what that means. The real economy, Wall Street, on, which holds our lives in its hands, is not the real economy. What is it if it's not the real economy? It's a gambling casino. And people who invest are not investing in businesses that can increase, you know, build a new plant, develop a new product. I mean, some people do that, but that's not what mostly they're doing. Mostly, the movement of shares back and forth is one shareholder selling it to another shareholder, the company doesn't get anything out of that. So the activity of the, finan of the financial world is divorced from what it was initially established to do, which was to finance uh, economic development and growth. Now, the people who did it wanted to make money, but what they did was finance, lubricate the engine of, uh, of material economic progress. That's not what anyone in finance thinks is the point of finance now. So there is no question that there has been a dramatic change in values in the financial world and arguably in many other professions where the only point now is to make money by any means possible as opposed to to make money, to, make, to do well while doing good. And doing good means one thing for a banker and another thing for a doctor and another thing for a lawyer and another thing for a teacher. They all want to get paid, but that's not why, that doesn't drive either what they do or how they do it. That's what's go gone away. And so this saps the, this is what demoralizes people because money just doesn't do it. You know, it's nice to have more rather than less. But what makes people happy in their lives is being cl well, close connections with other people and meaningful work. To have close connections to other people, if our story is right, demands that you be wise. To do meaningful work, if our story is right, demands that you be wise. If you are wise, you will be happy, which of course is what Aristotle thought. Uh, and if you simply develop the tools that will enable you to make a lot of money, you'll have a lot of money, but you won't have good social relationships and you won't be doing work that is meaningful and as a result, you won't be happy. So 
somehow we need to change the values that drive institutions like the financial industry before we can or at the same time that we try to develop wisdom in practitioners so i think you're right that what buffett has to say is incompatible with what we have to say and it is merely a symptom of how far along the wrong path that particular activity has moved from from earlier days that's that's my interpretation so jimmy stewart and it's a wonderful life which everyone sees once a year at christmas time and that's the exemplar of the non warren buffett old time banker who has a fiduciary responsibility not just to particular clients but to the whole community who puts money in the bank and he takes pride in his work i mean he's in the he's not in the banking business as a charity he's in it it's it's a business to make money but but it's a practice for him too it's giving loans to people who need it and it's taking care of people's money it's being responsible for it how different he is from the people with the golden parachutes who take the money and run when things collapse i mean it it reflects what barry's saying is that there's the change that you're talking about those those two different models and it wasn't that long ago it was as recently as the 70s and the 80s that that being an investment banker meant taking a fiduciary responsibility for your clients and partly that changed not simply because of the some magical corruption of the soul or character of bankers but it also changed because of public policies and a certain kind of competition which which lured bankers not simply into serving their clients but in trying to invest money themselves and it was reinforced by public policies like the Graham boot boot bill which eliminated the famous glass steagall act and allowed commercial banks to go into investment banking so there are structures there's policies there's politics that are out there which actually shape the working environment and there's parts of our culture out there that reshape the working environment but it it's not it's not that much of a stretch in in our own lifetimes to see businessmen in this case will do bankers since that's what's on the agenda now in the newspapers and in the economy that that actually took that actually had character virtue and wisdom who were able to combine money making with a practice that had an aim which was a service aim and who led wonderful lives doing that in terms of what Barry was saying about happiness just to give some images to underline what Barry was saying let me just add one one last thing to that uh even the investment bank has dramatically changed in the last 15 or 20 years investment banks used to make their money mostly by managing the assets of clients and making trades on behalf of clients best interests recently these investment banks including some who have gone under discovered that they could make much more money by trading for themselves than they could by trading for clients so lehman brothers um i mean they don't all do badly all of these banks have traders who trade company money in the hope of increasing company wealth they are not working for anybody they're working for themselves this is a this is a dramatic change in what investment banks do that didn't occur in a dramatic fashion it occurred in a gradual fashion because it was more lucrative to make profits than it was to make fees um and clearly if that's what you're doing you are no longer in the business of serving anyone except yourself you know uh and that's the way most investment banks nowadays operate